Today, in part two of our series, The Story, God Builds a Nation. We discover that God decides to build a nation using a fourfold plan designed to win us all back to himself. Let's join Pastor Mark as he describes how God reveals that plan and the turbulent beginnings of the new nation unfold as God chooses ordinary people like you and me to make it all happen. When I was, uh, when I was in my early 20s, um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time uh, not listening uh, to God. Um, I, I knew, uh, or at least I felt this calling uh, into ministry from, from my early teens, or mid-teens, I guess, um, and I, I promptly um, ignored it. Um, I, I very, very quickly said, no, that doesn't sound good for me. Um, so I spent a lot of years kind of doing my own thing. Uh, I, was, uh, I was in construction for a long time. I managed restaurants for a while. Uh, I ended up with a couple degrees, uh, none of them in ministry. Um, and I just kept thinking, hey, I'm just going to do what I want to do um, and let that kind of feeling that I have <clears throat> kind of go by the wayside. And it wasn't until um, I was leading a, a small group in my living room with my roommates um, that I started to actually listen to what God was talking about. Um, we have these little papers that we get, kind of like what Seth you know, prints out for us in our devotional. It's all kind of written there. You ask the questions, read the verses. Uh, and I would sit on my computer and have my Bible open, and I'd spend hours poring over this, adding extra stuff to this Bible study. Um, and one of those moments, I kind of was like, you know, maybe there's something more to this. Uh, maybe this, this feeling that I've had, uh, maybe it's time that I can step out into faith and actually listen to what God is asking me to do. Um, and, you know, years pass, and, and here I am today. Um, and all this to be said that... Um, Today, we're, we're talking about faith and, and what it looks like uh, when we listen to uh, what God has put into our lives uh, rather than uh, try and do it on our own. Um, and who we're looking at today is a man named Abraham. Uh, you may have heard of him. He, he's a neat guy. Um, he's the father of a nation, uh, and we're going to look at the beginnings of that. But before we do, I have a little map here. Um, you're going to see up kind of on the top the, the Tigris and the Euphrates, and right where those kind of merge uh, is a, a place called Ur. And, and that's, where, um, <clears throat> that's where the Tower of Babel that, that Seth talked about last week uh, was located, and that's where this new nation uh, is going to start taking place. Uh, so let's just go ahead and get right into it. Uh, Genesis 12, verses 1 through 4, uh, the Lord had said to Abram, uh, this is before it was Abraham. He had to have a different name. Uh, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. Whenever curses you, I will curse. Now all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. Now, if, if I'm God, uh, and I'm thinking of building a new nation, uh, and I'm going to start with one couple, um, I'm going to start probably with a young couple that's full of potential, okay? Uh, a couple, like, like a, a, a Christy and a Ryan, right? <clears throat> you know, newlyweds. They could still kind of live on a shoestring if they needed to. Um, you know, they can just go out and do. Uh, that makes more sense to me, right? Uh, God, on the other hand, uh, he chooses a 75-year-old man and a 65-year-old woman, okay? Um, not only that, um, but uh, a barren 65-year-old woman. So all, not only is she too old, more than likely, to have kids, uh, but she wasn't able to have kids in the first place, okay? Uh, and he says, hey, you are going to be the ones that are going to do this. He also chose a couple whose parents and grandparents were pagans, okay? So these aren't like these good God-following people. <clears throat> these are just these old people that spent their entire lives kind of setting their ways, doing their thing in their place. Uh, <clears throat> I'm, I'm not a person that typically likes change. Um, and I know as I get older, that's going to get worse and worse and worse for me. Uh, I have a grandfather. Uh, he's, he's 91 years old. Uh, 94 years old? 93 years old. Um, <laughs> Right in the middle. Um, and, uh, and I know as a fact that he likes everything the same every single day. Nothing's going to change. Uh, and I imagine for Abraham and Sarah, they're getting to that point where it'd be kind of nice if we just stuck with our routine. But instead, God says, nope, uh, I want you guys to pick up, pack up, and get out. And the crazy thing is, they did it, right? They listened. 
they had this feeling, this prompting, this voice, wherever it was, however God spoke to them, uh, and they just got up and went. They took all their stuff and they left. Uh, in, in Hebrews 11, 8, uh, Paul tells us that uh, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. It's so easy sometimes to be like, okay, um, I know that if I plug my stuff into my GPS, it's going to take me here. That's the spot. But imagine if God said, hey, get in your car and go, and I'll tell you when you get there. Right? That's a lot more faith, I think, that's put into that uh, than we typically be willing or comfortable doing. And we didn't even have GPSs and cars back then either, right? So it's just lace up your sandals and go, brother. Um, and he did. And, and I think uh, there's a couple reasons why God chose Abraham and Sarah. Uh, number one, um, because uh, they were old and unlikely. Uh, the, the fact that they were not the obvious choice uh, was why they chose them. Because if you think about it, uh, if, it's, if it's the Christian Ryan, right, uh, they can take credit for it. They like, you know, it's because we, we went and we did, we were fruitful and multiplied, we brought other people in under our umbrella, and we created this nation. We, we did it, uh, you know, uh, we pulled ourselves up by the bootstraps and went. <clears throat> for Sarah and for Abram, <clears throat> it's the idea of God had to intervene. Without him there, this whole thing wouldn't happen. And so all these other nations that are around that are already formed are going to be formed. They have to look at it and say, that was because something mighty happened with them. That without God, this thing would not have taken place. And their trust and their faith in God to fulfill his promise to them is what made it possible. So according to this verse, uh, it looks like God has kind of a fourfold plan, uh, a little bit of an overachiever. I think he could have done it in three, but whatever. Uh, number one, that God will make the new nation great, okay? That this nation is going to be great. And as we fast forward, as we go through the story, and we're going to see King David, uh, and we're going to see Solomon, and we're going to see how amazing and great this nation becomes, uh, number two, God will make Abram's name great. Abraham's name great. Uh, we still sing about him, right? Every VBS, we talk about Father Abraham and his many sons, right? <clears throat> his name is great. It's memorable. Uh, it's something that whether you're a Christian or not, you've probably heard of Abraham. He, he's the father of, a, of this nation. Uh, number two, God will bless all who bless Abraham and curse the ones who curse him. Uh, this is the story of the Old Testament. As we watch the, the nation of Israel rise and fall um, based on what's going on with them. And then number three, and this is probably the most important, or number four rather, and this is probably most important for us today. Uh, God will bless all the nations of the world through Abraham and the new nation. God will use the new nation to reveal his heart and his plan to win us back. You see, we as Christians have been adopted into this family. As people here in this church, we have the ability or even the responsibility to bless this world. We're part of that nation that Abraham started thousands and thousands of years ago. Uh, and we get to go around and help people out. We get to be a blessing to them. We get to share the gospel of Jesus Christ with them. That's, that's a blessing, right? And that's part of God's plan from the very beginning for us today. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for, for Abraham and Sarah, uh, things don't go smoothly the whole time. Uh, we're going we're gonna to jump a few scenes. I definitely recommend going and, and reading this story because uh, it's phenomenal. Uh, if you can picture an 85-year-old man going around uh, leading an army and killing people, uh, it's pretty cool. Um, but he does that. Um, he also uh, is in Egypt, and he lies about his wife, and things happen because of that. Uh, there's all kinds of cool stuff that happens in the story, so go check it out. But what we're going to fast forward to um, is that Sarah and Abraham are getting older. And as they get older, they still aren't having any children. And Sarah starts to kind of freak out a little bit. Um, she's not sure what's going on, yet she wants to trust God anyway. But what she does is says, well, let's try it my way. Let's see if we can do this a little different. So if we go to Genesis 16, uh, 1 and 2. Now Sarah, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, The Lord has kept me from having children. 
Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a family through her. Abram agreed to what Sarah said. A couple things. Um, this wasn't an uncommon practice, okay? This is something that happened. Um, if you wanted to continue your legacy, sometimes you would do it through kind of your property or the people that were under you. Um, so that isn't uh, an abnormal thing for Sarah to say. Um, and it's not also uh, abnormal for Abram to say, sweet, good deal. Um, <clears throat> She's a younger woman, um, and uh, sure, why not? Um, which I think there's two mistakes there, uh, both on Sarah's part and Abraham's part. Um, but, uh, but Sarah proposes this idea to get their new nation underway, um, and it, it's not in God's plan. And, and I think that this, uh, more than anything maybe in the story, uh, is something that we tend to do. And maybe we think, you know, I know this is what God wants for my life, but it's taking too long. Maybe I can just kind of do this instead. You know, I, I'm a good, honest citizen, but, you know, I'm just not going to write all the money I made on my taxes, and that'll be fine. You know, that'll really help me out, because God wants me to have this money. You know, for our students, you're like, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not usually cheating, but I can just see his paper right there, and, you know, it won't be a big deal if I get all the answers right. And we, we just have this thing where, even though we know the right thing, even though we know what God wants from us, we tend to want to short-circuit it a little bit. We kind of want to take the easy way or the, or the, uh, the way that we're going to say is the better way um, or the way that just seems like the right thing even though we know it's not exactly the right thing, right? So Sarah has this thing and it happens uh, and they, bore, they have a son, his name's Ishmael. Um, and God actually chooses to bless Ishmael, um, and he has his own thing that happens. Uh, it's another story you can look at. Um, but Ab Abraham and Sarah um, talk to God again, and, and God tells Abraham, this isn't the right way, but I still have a plan for you. Trust me. Trust me. Uh, and uh, 10 more years pass. <laughs> 10 more years pass through this couple, uh, and they're choosing to trust and do their best to uh, see where God wants them to go, where he's taking them. Um, and then uh, three visitors come. And this is one of my favorite things about the Old Testament. Uh, as, I'm, as I'm studying in school, we have these things called Christophanies. Uh, and it's this idea um, that Jesus came in the Old Testament and showed himself in different ways, in different places. Uh, and we believe this is one of these Christophanies, uh, the idea that Jesus in person came uh, and showed himself to Abraham and Sarah. So if we look at Genesis 18, 10 through 2, uh, they're, they're sitting there, they're having a meal together. Um, Sarah's in one of the tents. Abraham has, has prepared this meal for these three people, and they're hanging out, um, and they're talking. And Sarah's kind of eavesdropping from the tent a little bit. Um, and then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, now I will have this pleasure? I just, I love picturing, you know, Sarah kind of sitting there in the tent, and that uncontrollable little <clears throat> sneaks out, right? <clears throat> She's like, that's, that's the most ridiculous thing that I've ever heard. Um, uh, yet, that's a promise that's made to them. So at 100 years old and 90 years old, respectively, uh, they're promised their own child. Sarah laughs at this preposterous notion. Uh, yet, this supernatural young boy is born to them. His name's Isaac. They finally have the beginning of their new nation, okay? Three. Um, <clears throat> so they're really, uh, they're really doing it. Um, but so now we have this kid, and, and, and I'm a dad. Um, I have a little girl that I love to death. Uh, but when, when Charlotte, you know, Jessica was pregnant with Charlotte, and, um, and we went in um, for, for the C-section. Jessica had a C-section. Um, and so we go into the hospital, and they take Jessica away to, to prep her for surgery. And, and I'm sitting in the hallway at the hospital. Um, they've given me a, a 3XL gown to wear. <laughs> Uh, and I'm obviously only a 2XL. Um, <clears throat> so I'm like tying it in knots to try and like figure out how to make this thing fit me. Um, and I'm hanging out here and for like a long time, and I'm kind of like, am I going to miss this thing? Like, when are they going to come get me? 
And they finally bring me into the room, and, and Jessica's there on the table, um, and, and she looked beautiful. And, um, and I have the camera, and I'm standing there, and they have this big sheet, and they start the operation. I won't go into detail. Um, it looked more like an autopsy than an operation. That's all I'll say. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but they finally, uh, they finish up what they're doing, and they, and they pull out this baby. And the first thing I see is this little blue butt that pops up. <clears throat> And it's the most beautiful thing. And then they flip her over, and she has this one little cry. Uh, and it's just like, my world has changed. You know, the, the, this baby coming to the world, everything's different now. And, and I'm so in love, and I no longer want a motorcycle or a bungee jump. I just want to live and take care of this baby. <clears throat> and, and they're holding him up, but, uh, but she's not crying anymore. She just had that one. And, uh, and then they bring her over. The doctor hands her to a nurse, and they put her on this tray, and she's still blue, and the nurses are all looking at her, and they're not touching her, and nothing's happening for, like, what feels like forever. And then one of the nurses runs over this red phone, like a little bat phone, and she gets on it, and she says, hey, I need you in here now, and slams it. And this other nurse comes running in, and the baby's sitting there, and she goes to reach down to pick up Charlotte, and then Charlotte starts to cry. And I tell you, in, in that minute or 30 seconds, whatever it was, uh, from going from this, this joy of everything's changed, I have this baby, I went immediately into I've already failed. That as, as a dad, I wasn't able to take care of my girl, and she was just born. And, and so I'm freaking out, but then she cries, and the pink starts to spread across her body as the blue goes away. And, and the nurse says, well, you know, guess I just had to be here. And the nurses laugh. And I say, that's not funny. <laughs> that's not funny at all. That's my little girl. Um, but she was okay. And you've seen, she's okay. And now we got to do it again. And it's freaking me out a little bit. <clears throat> but we're so excited. Um, but but that's, that's what's going on with Abraham, right? I mean, Isaac is born and he has his boy, Right? And he's so excited, and he has this promise from God that he's, he's going to have this great nation. And he sees this boy and says, yes, this boy's going to make a great nation. I believe in him. And he's ecstatic. And then God says, <clears throat> take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on a mountain I will show you. Can you imagine he just got it. He just got the gift, the baby boy. <clears throat> and now you're saying you want him back? Now there's a couple of things here um, that we want to think of. Uh, this is one of those verses that we, we like to look at and go, not my God. Oh, that doesn't sound right. Not the God that I know. Um, or we kind of maybe just skip through it and say, oh, you know, I don't like those verses. <clears throat> but there's a couple of things here. Number one, uh, again, at this time period, this isn't an uncommon practice uh, amongst worship. It's the ultimate thing you can do to show your God that you love him uh, in some of these religions. That's what they say. Or to get what you want from him. Right? Uh, we actually know that Abraham uh, actually had a much uh, better reason uh, for doing this. In, in Hebrews, uh, Paul tells us uh, that he, he thought God was going to bring him back from the dead. He trusted God so much. He says, yeah, I will do this because I know you can do something because of this. He trusted God with so much faith. He says, God, I'll just bring him back from the dead. No big deal. Now, there's not cases of resurrection before this. <clears throat> but Abraham said, you know what? God can do whatever he wants. And I have faith in him that he is going to protect my baby boy. So they go up to the top of this mountain they build this altar. <clears throat> he puts Isaac on the altar. He's getting ready to do what he needs to die, do. <laughs> and something happens. A voice comes, stop. Don't do it. I have something else to do the sacrifice with. A ram caught in the thistles, right? It's horns, <clears throat> like in that picture. <clears throat> The ram stuck in the, in the uh, thistles is sacrificed on Isaac's behalf. Isaac lives. Isaac has two sons. One of those sons has 12 sons. One of those sons 
gets a really cool, colorful coat that you're going to learn about next week. <clears throat> um, this is kind of the end of, of Abraham's story. And it's a full life after he had lived a full life, right? I mean, he went through a lot on God's behalf. And he did it with faith. I would like to encourage everybody in this room, if, if there's something that you have that you know God has wanted for you, to see what it looked like if you actually went and did it. If there's things in your life where like Sarah, you've said, you know, I just want to kind of do it my own way. What would it look like if you actually did it God's way? We're going really short <laughs> today. Um, I wanted to bring up one last point. Um, this, this mountain, this place where this sacrifice um, was about to take place uh, is actually a very specific spot. Because 2,000 years later, in this exact same spot, another son was brought up to be sacrificed. His name was Jesus. Right? But this time, there wasn't a ram there to replace him. This time, the son actually had to be sacrificed. This time he was sacrificed on behalf of a much bigger nation, us. You see, Isaac was, was kind of a story of what's going to happen. And as we continue to read through the story, we're going to see that each of these stories, each of these key points along the way, they're all pointing towards Jesus. Each one is a little road sign. Each one is a mile marker. Each one is something that is telling the tale of Jesus before he comes. You know, each of us live in this world uh, where we are told that we can do whatever we want. Uh, as long as we, we work harder or we're better than the next guy uh, or we're just pushing through. The Bible tells us a different story. The Bible tells the story of, you know, we can't do anything without God. Anything worth doing is doing because we've trusted and put our faith into God to see us through. And because of what Jesus did, that sacrifice that he made, I mean, imagine, you guys, Isaac, this baby boy, right? Jesus, God's baby boy. <clears throat> the Romans are the perfectors of torture and murder, okay? It's what they did best. The cross, they're Mona Lisa, right? The best thing they ever made in order to kill people. <clears throat> our Lord, our Savior, the man who lived the perfect life, God himself was willing to be sacrificed on that cross for each and every one of us. Imagine, my baby boy, my baby boy, but God knew it was the best decision for us. It was the best decision for us to be able to be with him forever. We've had a, a couple weddings recently. Um, my favorite party is a wedding party. Uh, that unity, that celebration of love, the best food, the best music, the dancing, the cheer, the love. That's what heaven's talked about as. This eternal wedding party the eternal unity of love as we come together in fellowship and relationship with God forever. That's our hope. That's what we're looking forward to. That's why God chose to let Jesus die on that cross on our behalf. Father, we thank you for the, the story of, of Abraham and Sarah, for Isaac, Lord, for the birth of a nation. Uh, Lord, I pray that we can uh, live out that fourth note on the fourfold plan, um, that we can be part of that nation that is here to bless you and to bless others. Lord, that through us, more and more people can meet you, more and more people can have a relationship with you, more and more people can experience what we call the five Bs. Uh, but Lord, we love you. We're thankful for you and everything you do each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen. We at Pacific Church of Irvine invite you to join us every Sunday at 9.30.
You can also visit our website at pacificchurch.com.